in case you aren't familiar with the AGU already, I know I'm in Boulder and um, there are so many earth and space scientists here, but we are a member society, a nonprofit. Uh, we publish 24 journals across the earth and space sciences. Uh, we have 60,000 members um, internationally, and we have a number of programs that are uh, designed to advance the practice of science. Open Science, the team that I'm on, is one of those uh, one of those efforts. Next slide, please. So I, I want to talk a little bit about what open science is. Open science means many things to many people. It's a pretty nebulous concept. Uh, it's supposed to be increasing access not just to scientific outputs, so you might think of papers, data, software, but also to the practice of science, to breaking down barriers to have communities who haven't always been engaged in the practice of science to be able to engage with it. Uh, you can see the practice of open science throughout the research ecosystem. It starts in your research, working more openly on your teams, inviting participation from people onto your teams, uh, working with open methodologies. During a publication process, you can engage in open peer review. You can publish your work as a preprint to help it get it out to um, audiences more quickly. You can publish open access articles. You can publish um, on open education. Open educational resources are a big part of open science. Uh, this is one thing, this is my favorite part of open science uh, because I'm a researcher and I love to talk about um, efficiency and how open science can benefit um, research and result in more discovery. This is the reuse component. Uh, when you're thinking about how to practice open science in your own work, you might think about open data and open software. These are two really key elements of open science. If you're opening up your data, if you're sharing it more widely, if you're documenting it well, similarly for your software, you're enhancing the practice of research because you're making sure that nobody has to duplicate your effort. You're making sure that all the work that you've done to go into that data and software um, is going to build and that other people can build on your work. And finally, no discussion of open science is complete without a discussion of funding and evaluation. Uh, we hear a lot from people about um, evaluation. I need to know how open science can benefit my career because I'm being evaluated. I have to make these targets. Uh, they're all publication-based or citation-based or my age index needs to grow. Uh, so open science also incorporates more open methods of evaluation, open metrics, and funder policies on data and software sharing. Next slide, please. Uh, so open science has a lot of benefits for research. Uh, the first is that it accelerates discovery. Um, if you can connect researchers to data sets that they need to better understand and address major geoscience questions or any major scientific questions you might be looking at, that's, a, that's something that's enhancing research efficiency. That's making it quicker to get to the answers that we need to solve urgent questions like climate change, like natural hazards, across scientific research. Uh, open science also broadens your research impact. Open science, practicing this in your own work, can lead to more citations for your own work. It can lead to more collaborations, not just with other researchers, but with the public, with the people who really need to understand your work and to act on it. Open science also builds trust in science. This is a big one for us in the US, I think. Uh, we want to make sure that the science, the science that we are doing is accessible to the public, that it's trusted, and that decision makers can use our science and act on it to make evidential policy, evidence-driven policy decisions. Next slide, please. Uh, a few more tangible benefits uh, for those of us who might be thinking about our Google Scholar. Uh, so on the left here, I have a little graph. This is an analysis of HU articles from 2020 to 2021. And we looked at articles that had a data citation embedded in the article. So basically authors who shared their data, who opened up their data alongside their article. Um, and the right is the authors who didn't quite make it to that stage. When we look at citations per article for that one year period, we see that authors who are sharing their data are getting cited more. Their work is getting built on more. People are seeing their intellectual contribution. They're seeing the data that underlies that research, how reproducible their work is, and they're able to build on it. It's not just AGU. Papers that cite data are 25% more likely to be cited by others. Open access articles get up to five times more page views, uh, not just from researchers, but from the public, from media outlets who might want to promote your work. And they get more citations as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so those are a few of the benefits that open science can have for your immediate practice of science. Uh, but there's also a push federally across the US that you all may be familiar with already. I'll walk through it a little bit. Um, in 2013, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, issued a memo called the Holdren Memo. And this memo, um, which is dictated to federal agencies and helps them set their policies on publication, data, and software, says that research publications, uh, so any paper that you publish as an output of your federally funded research, must be accessible to the public after only a one-year embargo. 
So it can only be behind a paywall for one year, then it needs to be out to the public in some form. It also emphasized the importance of public access to research data sets. We're elevating data, we're elevating software is important elements of your research. We're not just talking about papers anymore. We want other things to be able to be accessible as well. In 2022, the Office of Science and Technology Policy doubled down on this. Uh, now publications and their supporting data, so this is a December, December 31st of 2025 deadline, if you're wondering why you haven't seen this yet, um, we give federal agencies some time to enact these policies. Uh, publications and their supporting data should be publicly accessible, so no embargo. And we're including supporting data as well as publications themselves. The memo also emphasized the importance of data access by the public to all the data that comes out of all federally funded research. So a lot of agencies are working on their data policies now, working on better sharing data to make sure that we can practice this open science. Next slide, please. Uh, so I do work for the AGU. I'm obligated to throw a little promo slide in here. But um, because we do have a lot of earth scientists around, I also want to show what the member community has done for open science so far. Uh, HEU and the, the community interaction with open science principles and anachronies in the earth and space sciences goes back a number of years. Uh, in 2021, we enacted uh, or we published a policy that we have enacted in our journals that requires authors to share alongside their publications in HEU journals the data that supports that publication. As it enhances reproducibility, enhances transparency, in the work that AGU authors are doing, as well as allowing them more access to collaborative um, work with others. In 2022 and 2023, we've made a big push to de dedicate more staff time to helping authors implement this. Authors have come to us with a lot of questions about how to share their data, what's an appropriate way to share their data, uh, what time should I share it, etc. So we've dedicated staff efforts helping them do this right. Uh, and we've also implemented an open science recognition prize if you work in the earth and space sciences, you might recognize uh, these software packages and solutions. Uh, these were some of our first awardees for the Open Science Recognition, open science recognition Prize, uh, which was held at AGU 23 in San Francisco. We believe that these incentives are equally as important as the infrastructure for open science to make sure that researchers have the time and the energy that they need to work more openly. Next slide, please. Uh, so I mentioned the data citation pilot. I'm going to talk a little bit about why we think data citation and software citation is important. You probably are all familiar with citation of research papers. You publish a research paper, you cite other people's work. That is the way that you demonstrate that they have made an, a measurable intellectual contribution to your practice of science. We don't really have that standard for data and software, even though people spend hours and hours of effort on preparing good data sets and good software that can underlie other people's work. Our data citation pilot is designed to address that by asking authors to build those connections from the papers that they publish to other data sets or their own data sets, to software packages that they've used, to make sure that credit and attribution and those links for reproducibility and transparency are drawn between papers, data, and software. Since we've rolled out the data citation pilot, which provides staff support to help authors do this, we've seen the number of HEU papers published in our journals that contain a data set citation uh, more than uh, double from under 40% in 2021 uh, to over almost 90% of our articles now contain a link to the data that underlies that research publication. And we think this is so important for the practice of science. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the actions that you can take right now to open up your science in a small way or a big way. I like to think about um, some of the different elements that underlie a research career like this. We have publications traditionally central to the way that we evaluate and um, assess progress on a research project. But we also have the researcher's digital presence, how they present that science to the world. Uh, of course, it includes your in-person presence at conferences like AGU and beyond as well. Uh, but you need a way to show the world what you're doing. You need a way for researchers across the world to be able to access your research, to understand what your expertise is, and more. We also want to elevate the data and software that support those publications and that can be research outputs in their own right. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk at first about digital science, digital presence as a skill set that you can adopt to open up your work a bit. Uh, who searches your digital presence? It can be anyone and everyone. Uh, potential new collaborators, your advisor, your employer. I used to be a journal editor. I looked at people's digital presence day in and day out, looking for experts to assess research articles that were submitted to our journal. Funders, societies, and associations, and crucially, uh, other um, groups, community groups, local government decision makers. These are people who don't know necessarily 
the channels that they should use to find a science expert. If your digital presence is well maintained, they can easily find you and ask you questions about your work. Next slide, please. By maintaining your digital presence properly, you can connect with new collaborators, you can increase citations to your work and the impact of your work, and you can highlight your contribution to science beyond the publication. So it's important for you, the researcher, as well as the practice of science as a whole. Next slide. Uh, I like to include this slide as well. This is a little humorous to me. I have an extremely uncommon name. There's only one Christina Braunbelder in the entire world. So I'm not a good example to use for digital presence because when you Google me, you immediately find everything that I've done for good or bad. However, uh, my partner's name is Charlie Show. When you search Charlie Show, uh, you get a marine safety expert in Laguna Beach. You get a Vietnam War vet who um, took to that experience during the Vietnam War and turned it into some really evocative paintings. And then finally, you get Charlie, the research geomorphologist. This is an example of why maintaining your digital presence might mean, mean a lot to you, especially if you're a John Smith or a Charlie Show. Next slide, please. The tool that we advise researchers to use to help maintain their digital presence is to assign yourself a persistent identifier, an ORCID. Um, these are designed for researchers. There are a unique 16-digit string of numbers that only refers to you. So no matter what your name is, you have that unique 16-digit string. And you can see Charlie is the only Charles show in ORCID. Next slide, please. Using your ORCID, you can tie in all elements of your research career, your education, your work history, your publications, even your peer review or service, your presentations, posters, and preprints, and your data sets and software. So we're moving beyond that Google Scholar look where you have all your publications and your H index, but not necessarily anything else. And we're building a true and comprehensive digital CV that uniquely identifies you. Next slide, please. Once you've built out your ORCID record, uh, you can include information about your employment, your professional activities, um, and even your peer reviewing. Next slide, please. And crucially, uh, this is the thing about ORCIDs I think is so useful. You can set up automatic linking and updating. Once you start including your ORCID in all of your work, you can set up tools that make it so that your digital CV, your ORCID, is being maintained automatically for you uh, by these infrastructure connections that we've built in science. Uh, so if you set up automatic linking, include your ORCID in your research outputs, share your work, then your CV is updated automatically for you. As someone who had to make a calendar hold recently uh, to update my professional achievements every month because I kept forgetting things I had done, this is really meaningful to me. And I hope that you agree. Next slide. How do you set up automatic linking? There's a great tutorial on ORCID's website, but you'll want to primarily link to Crossref, to link your publications, and to Datasite, uh, which will draw in your presentations, your posters, your data sets, and your software. Next slide, please. Um, there's a great tutorial on if something's missing, you can always add it manually yourself. Uh, you can import works from a BibTeX file if you already have that to make sure they populate your ORCID. Uh, and you can add works using an identifier on those persistent identifiers like DOIs that identify your papers, your data sets, and your software. Next slide, please. Now, what do you use your ORCID for? Uh, this is a great one. Include it in manuscript submission. Not just if you're the corresponding author, but if you're a co-author, include your ORCID. I can't tell you how many times I was looking for a reviewer for a journal article, and I couldn't figure out if they were the same person, uh, or I couldn't find the rest of their work or only the corresponding author had an ORCID. You can include it in grant applications as prompted. And this is a really cool tip. If you are applying for NSF funding, or if you're applying for NIH funding, or maybe if you're working in Canada, um, you can connect your ORCID to Science CV, the new standardized format for uh, describing your current and pending support in your bio sketch, and have it auto-populate for you. Uh, you can also export your works from ORCID to a BibTeX file, so a reference file, and use that to populate your own CV, whatever format that might be in. ORCID will also export directly to digital measures. Uh, many people in this room probably aren't using digital measures, but lots of university faculty have to do a digital measures profile every year, and it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. It's a pain. Uh, so you can use your ORCID to help with that. Uh, and make sure you're including it in your business cards, your website, your CV, your posters, so that people, when they're walking by your conference poster, can easily find the rest of your work. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's your digital presence. I hope I've convinced you that it's both a time saver and it can be good for your public profile and your research impact. I'm now going to talk about data, uh, one of the key elements of any researcher's career. Next slide. The question we get a lot at EGU is, what does it mean to have open data? 
what kind of data should I be sharing? Uh, what data is important? What data is not important? This is a question that depends on the domain. But in general, uh, we start with the data underlying your publications. We, of course, ask that as our policy at AGU, that you share that when you're publishing with us. But you can also share any of the data that your research produces. And this is truly open. You don't have to have published on it, even if it's a data set that you know, is from a, a field site that you, know, you haven't quite figured out what the research question is. You can put that data out there. It's a unique and it's a, high, it's a highly important output of the work that you've done. Uh, for the urban space sciences, your data might include data from observations collected in the field, data from satellites, data from lab experiments. Um, and if you're worried and you don't know what to share, you can always default to just sharing the data that's in the figures in your paper. Share that data alongside your paper for maximum reproducibility and transparency. Next slide, please. Getting your data ready is really important uh, because <laughs> Uh, you know, people come to me all the time and they say, nobody understands my data like I do. Nobody will ever be able to work with it. Why should I bother going through this effort? My answer is always, well, you should also go through the effort to try to document your data, to try to make it reusable. Not just so that other people can use it, but I've been in so many research groups where uh, we have a data set from 10 years ago that's now really important, but it wasn't well documented at the time. Uh, that data exists, but it's almost unusable. It can be good for your own research group's uh, work, it can be good for your own career as well as for helping other people reuse it. Always include good metadata, data about the data, which will include information about the methodology you use to, to collect your um, information. It could include um, sample conditions. It could include instrument information, all of that kind of stuff. Make sure to create standardized and logical file structures and file names at the outside of the project, not halfway through. This is something I always have to tell myself. Uh, and communicate those to your group. Make sure your group understands the kind of system that everyone should be using to keep things organized. Um, include readme files. Uh, set up automatic backups. Can't be said enough. Uh, and then use proprietary, non-proprietary file formats for long-term use. Uh, don't use things that will be outdated in a few years that will make your data inaccessible. Uh, we always advise people to preserve their data in a repository with a persistent identifier like a DOI. This is extremely crucial. Storing files on Google Drive is not permanent storage, it's not citable, and it's not actually compatible with peer review uh, because it's not completely anonymous. Uh, when you preserve your data in a repository with DOI and with metadata, that's when you're truly enabling reuse. You're putting your data out there permanently into the scientific record. By assigning it a DOI, you're enabling all of the good things we just talked about. Data citation to your work, giving you credit, uh, automatic linking to your ORCID so that you can see the data you've produced over the course of your project. Uh, and that will help with discovery, uh, being able to cite your data in your papers with that DOI. Um, and if you have data portals in your field, you can add your data to those data portals for additional discovery, uh, if appropriate. Next slide, please. Choosing a repository for your data is a really important question. It depends on domain. It also depends on whether you're working for a federal agency or not, where your funding comes from. Uh, so I won't get too much into the specifics of that. We do have an email helpline called datahelp at agu.org that can help you, and there are a lot of resources online as well. Uh, but your repository should ideally be specific to your discipline. That way they'll be able to offer you the best advice on how to document your data for reuse. And it should offer your data set a citable and unique persistent identifier like a DOI to make sure there's always that permanent link to your data set. And again, Google Drive, Box, FTP servers, um, they can be things that people use to store uh, temporarily, but they're not uh, really great for permanent storage. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about software now. Uh, this is something that a lot of people in this room have a lot of opinions on, I'm sure, and will be far more expert than I am in it. Uh, but I will share a few of the general principles that we get researchers started with, and also a few tips uh, for making sure that the software that you're publishing is actually citable. Next slide, please. A lot of the things that um, apply to data, getting your data ready for your use, also apply to software. You should always really use open source software tools when possible to make sure that they're reusable. Um, creating standardized and logical burial names and file, file structures, and making sure that you're communicating this logic to the rest of your group so that everyone can be working on the same page. Choosing a license for your code to enable it to be reused, using a system for version control, uh, it seems extremely basic, but I have been part of a number of research teams uh, that were working on models that did not use version control, and it was very chaotic. And then finally, add a citation.cff file to your repository so that others can cite your work. 
This is a file that will live in your GitHub repository and includes exactly the information that others will need to give you that citation and if they use your model in a paper or what have you, and make sure there's that link back to you for credit. Next slide, please. This is what the citation.cnf file setup will look like. It'll peel the, peer the file in your repository, and then it'll produce this button in GitHub that says cite this repository. When you follow that, it'll give you an APA formatted citation. Uh, you fill in the information, so you fill in the author name, title, the DOI, et cetera. And it'll also give you an opportunity for GitTech export. It's compatible to Zenodo, so if you do this for your repository, and then you publish your repository on Zenodo and assign it a DOI, Zenodo will be able to use the information you have in the CFF file to populate the metadata for that record. It's also compatible with Zotero, uh, so it gives researchers who are using your work a really easy way to manage that reference. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, documenting your software. Uh, <laughs> we've talked a lot about this in uh, my group so far this week, uh, but there's a lot of good practices out there already. None of them are really specific to scientific software, but I think that um, everyone here can think about what styles of guides uh, look like for their language and apply that to their scientific software. Of course, commenting your code um, as you write it and not in one big fell swoop at the end, um, using a standardized format for variable and function names, imagine you'll need to explain your code to a colleague who hasn't been with you every step of the way. I find that really helpful in documenting code. If you're sharing your code with other scientists, it's helpful to include information about scenarios when your model can be or can't be applied, um, conditions for initial parameters. Uh, include readme files, of course, you guys know all about that. Uh, you can follow this QR code to a, a really great list on uh, resources from Johns Hopkins on documenting code. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned before that citation CFF file linked is a noto. And I mentioned how important it is to assign a DOI to your software and to your data to make sure it's citable and to create that link between your paper and your software. Uh, this is the general recommendation that we make for how to do this when you're publishing with APU. If you have a GitHub repository, you can easily push it to Zenodo, assign that exact version of your code, uh, DOI, through Zenodo, which does have support for versioning. So if you need to uh, push another version, get a DOI for that, you can always update it. And this will make sure that your code is out there, uh, that even if your code were to disappear from GitHub, or even if your code were somehow to be erased uh, some, some other way, that DOI page with the record and the information and the contribution that you made will always live there. Uh, so this is really important. Next slide, please. Okay, finally, uh, this is an AGU specific communication, but I hope it'll extend to other publishers in the future as well. Uh, if you're interested in publication, if you're interested in software, if you're working a lot on software and model development, AGU is going to be piloting in 2024 a new project. You all are familiar with traditional paper publishing where the end result is a PDF. It's not really interactive, it's not really clickable. The figures are just there as pictures. Uh, in 2024, we are going to be publishing computational notebooks, an interactive way to write about your uh, model, to share your data, to even have the reader interact with it in real time as they're reading through your introduction, your discussion, your methods section. These will have references sections, they'll have citations the same way that a normal paper would. They'll be peer reviewed, just as a normal paper is, but it'll be a more interactive format of publishing. If you're interested in that, I encourage you to visit the links at the bottom of this page. Uh, we'll have a tutorial video. We have a number of resources on what this might look like for early adopters, and you can sign up for updates if you want to be an early adopter. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've talked about digital presence, data, and software, uh, which is sort of the non-traditional elements of open science that I'm asking you to add to your practice. Now I want to talk to something that's very central to science, publication. What did you do with your publication to make it more open? Next slide, please. I'm specifically going to talk about how to make your research more open, more reproducible, and more transparent by making sure you share your data and software alongside your paper, and by building those linkages of credit, of attribution between your paper, data sets, and software. To do this, you need to plan where to share your data and software early. This isn't as important for software when you can just uh, send it to Zenodo, but if you would like to use a domain-specific repository that offers curation of your metadata, that offers standardized file formats, that takes time. So plan where to share your data early. Mm -hmm. Make sure that reviewers and editors have access to your data and software, and include a citation to your data and software in your paper. Next slide, please. 
what do we mean by software? We get this question all the time. People are like, should I like download MATLAB and like send it in alongside my paper? I'm like, no, no, you obviously don't need to do that. Uh, you can share the software or code that you use for analysis and visualization of the data, or software and code used to produce a model output. Obviously, if you use a proprietary program that you can't share, just mention it in your open research section. Let people know where they can go to access it. It's not your responsibility to overcome that, although it is good to use open source things when possible. If your work depends on Python and R scripting, if you're building off an existing package, either cite it if it's someone else's package, cite it if it's your own package, and make sure it's open and accessible, but make sure that credit and attribution is there. Next slide, please. Uh, at the end of every EGU paper, every Wiley paper, and a number of other publisher papers as well, you'll see an open research section which contains a statement that gives information about how to access the data and software underlying that paper. These people have even linked it to a specific figure in the paper, uh, so the data and the figure is exactly linked. It just makes it really easy for the reader to understand what's going on. Next slide, please. We've got a great tutorial on AGU's website of what exactly to include in the data availability statements uh, for both data and for software. Next slide, please. And we've got templates on our website that you can just do as a fill in the blanks. So if you're publishing with us, you can just grab one of these templates, insert here for your data, insert here for your software. Next slide, please. Um, this is what your data or software citation will look like if you publish with AGU. You publish with another publisher, it might be in a different reference manager uh, format, it might not be APA, but you should still include it. Um, the top is data and the bottom is software. These look very, very similar to references you would include, citations you would include to another research paper. Uh, there's just a few crucial differences. These include versions uh, for both data and software. Papers don't usually have versions, uh, but it's important to specify data versions and software versions because we understand these as evolving in time, unlike a paper which is a snapshot in time. They also include a DOI for the data and a DOI for the software to make sure those linkages are there. We also flag data set and software citations to make it easier for the reader to identify them and to follow through to that data and software. Next slide, please. So I hope I've given you a little bit of information about actions you can take right now to work more openly. A little bit of information that means if you come to publish HU in the future, you won't be blindsided by our new policies. Uh, and I hope I've convinced you that open science skills can help you work more collaboratively, can help you increase your own research impact, can help us all expand evaluation beyond the traditional metrics of uh, citation and publication, and can help science as a whole by enabling reuse and making the practice of science more efficient. Next slide, please. Uh, it's really been a uh, joy to be here this week. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. If you think of them later, you can always email me uh, right there or email anyone at HGU. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Christina. But we have two questions online, and then we can go to a virtual Q and A afterwards. Afterwards. Uh, so, from Mike Chupa from NOAA, suppose federally funded research generates terabytes of data. Who will be paying for public access to this research data? Sounds like a whopper of an unfunded mandate. Um, thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so part of my job at ATU is to uh, go to funders and to say these things. And we have been saying them. Uh, we respond to RFIs from NIH, from NSF, uh, from uh, NIST. And uh, this is a big question. There's a, a guy who I've worked with at NASA who has a graph that shows the amount of data they expect to be coming out of the next missions for the next 20 decades. And it's an exponential increase in the size of data. Um, these mandates do need to be funded. We need better support for data management and for software management. Um, and that's something that we're very interested in advocating for from the AGU. Thanks. Um, one last question online uh, from an anonymous person. Um, IP generated as a result of federally funded research is required to be protected. For software, IP is the method process underlying it. An individual should complete an intention disclosure and then it's up to them, plus government, to decide to pursue patent or other protection. How do we reconcile this with open size ethos? What's the order of operations for making it publicly available versus open, uh, public available or open versus IP protection? Um, that's a great question. I'm not an expert in licensing. However, I believe there are open source licenses that reserve to you the intellectual property right and the patent right, but still allow you to share. Um, I'll have to double check on that, but I believe that's the case. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Uh, so with the software version, you can speak up for the people online, perhaps. I'll play it. Everyone can hear me now. But uh, so for the version, uh, 
permission for software citations. Uh, does the system just pick it up, pick that up automatically from GitHub, for example? Or, like, for example, some codes don't have version tags, but they have like just a Git commit. So, can can the system pick that up and just place it there, or how or how does that work? That's a good question. I've never tested that in the link between GitHub and Zenodo. Um, but if that if uh, I'll have to look into that. Um, they are pretty responsive to like uh, these kinds of comments from both Zenodo and GitHub side. So I'm sure that's something that could be automated if it's not already. Hey, uh, great talk. I love the idea of this interactive potential publication and notebooks now idea. And wanted to, I guess, are there any plans? Of, like, it, it sounds like it's early in the process, but I guess as far as publishing those, is that something that you're currently looking at incorporating into current journals, or are you thinking about making an entirely separate journal that's all about interactive uh, work? Um, we've had a lot of discussions about this, and I honestly couldn't tell you. I'm not the primary on that project, so I couldn't tell you what the exact thinking is now. I think the intention is that ultimately we would like to see this as widely adopted as possible in journals, but we're still coming to terms with like the effort, the um, the back end needed. Uh, the, our partner on this, so uh, Curve Note, is uh, really interested in producing this as a model that can be used by multiple publishers and so not just AGU. Um, and I could see that in that sense, expanding, expanding not just across AGU journals, but across multiple publication outlets. But that's a, a far future topic in the, above my pay grade. <laughs> As an aside, uh, the NCARS Improving Scientific Software Conference coming up in April will be accepting and uh, promoting some uh, uh, computational notebooks as part of the proceedings. So look forward to that if you're planning to attend there in Boulder. Any other questions? Again, let's uh, uh, thanks, Christina, for your time, and we appreciate everyone participating online as well. And we'll send out the recording for others to uh, share as, as they might like. Uh, hope you all have a rest of your day. And uh, um, for those participating in the hackathon, uh, have fun and <laughs> make your make your software more open. Hopefully, thank you. <laughs>